Randomizers are my favorite way to play Pokemon because somehow they always end up surprising you. Pair that with the hardcore Nuzlocke rules where any Pokemon that faints is boxed forever and you got yourself a real challenge. And much like any Pokemon challenge, the first choice we have to make is our starter. And I've got a tough choice to make here. On the one hand, Dratini's super difficult to raise, but Dragonite's like one of the best Pokemon out there. Then there's Swampert, which is probably the best starter for a Nuzlocke ever. So naturally I went with a monkey. Listen, Chimchar may not be Dragonite or Swampert, but you can't deny he's got the hottest butt in the game. Speaking of which, this is the perfect time to show you guys I didn't just randomize encounters and trainer Pokemon, but also all their abilities. And having Drought on a Chimchar is nothing shy of beautiful. It wasn't exactly helpful versus how and his Dratini, but I ended up prevailing somehow nonetheless. Another important rule of the challenge is I only get to catch the first Pokemon I find in any area. And Route 1 is incredibly big in Sun and Moon, so I'm glad we got a really good encounter in Kirlia. I'm definitely not as excited about the minus special attack nature and the mummy ability since the last thing we want is Kirlia to get hit by a physical move. Ooh, a choice scarf. Now as for trainers Pokemon, before level 30, they can be randomized into anything. And after level 30, they're also gonna be fully evolved no matter what. This does of course present a massive challenge whenever your early game opponents have legendaries on their team. And rich kid Joey here of course had to have a Landorus of all things. Unfortunately, this matchup pretty much guarantees us to wipe right off the bat. But since the Landorus insists on going for Imprison the first turn, at least I can fire off a Growl so that the next incoming punishment doesn't punish me too hard. Then after at least getting some use out of Mummy, I desperately set up a double team. It actually immediately pays off and a Confusion does about a sixth. Another punishment brings me down below half to just nine HP, but my Ornberry that I found along the way brings me back up to 19. My next Confusion does a bit more than the first one, almost taking Landorus below half, and a punishment then hits me for exactly nine HP of damage as I hit another Confusion. Hoping it hits me for nine again, I survive on exactly one HP and can fire off a final Confusion before I have to swap out into Chimchar. And amazingly, Chimchar here survives both the Punishment and a Rock Tomb because of that Growl we used the very first turn and can take out the Landorus with an Ember. I can already tell we're gonna have a rough time with this run. Assault Vest. After graduating from Pokemon School, we actually get an encounter in Holy City. And having that encounter be Bulbasaur is pretty awesome, especially with the Berserk ability that I didn't even know what it did before this. But don't say that to my teachers at Pokemon School. Especially since the special attack boost after getting below half is a pretty awesome ability. Now normally the way this game goes is you lose to a Lima and you never play a Nuzlocke of this game ever again. But even though his Smeargle got randomized into a shiny Typhlosion, he just kept spamming smokescreen, so easy peasy. This means we can follow Hala to Route 2 where there's only one mandatory trainer we have to fight. And her one Pokemon could be randomized into anything out of the 809 options out there. So it'll probably just be something weak like, oh, of course it had to be a Rayquaza. Last time I played a randomizer, a Rayquaza stepped on my team more than you probably want Cynthia to step on you. But this time around, the Green Sock Puppet was level 9, and after learning that its only attacking move was Twister, I could easily just swap in my fairy type Kirlia and handle things from there. Lucky I had a fairy type. Before the first trial, there are still a couple encounters we can get, the first of which being a Spiro I find on Route 2. And Protean is a pretty awesome ability to make a mundane Pokemon like Spiro a little bit better. The other encounter we can get is at the Haoli Cemetery, and we're on a tear with these starters since it ends up being a Squirtle. The special attack boosting nature is certainly nice, but Rain Dish is really neither here nor there. Master Ball. This means it's time to take on the first trial, and another rule of the challenge is that I can't overlevel the totem Pokemon or Grand Trial before starting the trial. And after all the excitement in the run so far, I was pretty pleased to see I was fighting a Charmander. I didn't break a sweat beating it or the Ursa Ring that it called in. With our first trial of many behind us, we can now get our next encounter in Verdant Cavern. And Slugma with Infiltrator is pretty bad, I'm not gonna lie to you. Then on Route 3, I managed to find a Helioptile with the amazing Soul Heart, which is basically just special attack Moxie. But unless I find a Sunstone among the randomized field items, this thing's pretty much useless too. Preparing myself for the Grand Trial versus Hala, I make sure to evolve my starters into Monferno, Wartortle, and Ivysaur. Now Nurse Hala here is a formidable opponent, starting off the fight with Gliscor, one of my personal favorites, but not one of my personal favorites to face, especially not this early in the game. The one advantage we have is that Gliscor's greatest weakness is its special defense, and after getting hit by a quick attack, we can fire off a sun-boosted ember for about a third damage. Then since quick attack is about the most dangerous thing it can do to us, another couple embers is enough to take it out. His next Pokemon is a Cubone, 
Pokemon, but since this Pokemon can only attack us with normal or ground type moves, I decide to send in Spearow. A few Aerial Aces is enough to take it down, and a quick swap into Wartortle handles the Panseer. But things didn't quite go as smooth versus as Delcaddy. Seriously, if this lady gave you childhood trauma, I was in for something way worse. After being brutalized by a breakneck blitz, I definitely had to swap out. The only issue being that this Delcaddy knows both attract and sing. After putting a couple of my team members to sleep, I managed to sneak in some damage with a few mock punches before Monferno fell asleep as well. Then after Curlia got put to sleep too, my team was in rough shape. In fact, at this point, I'd been pushed so far into a corner that I kind of needed to sacrifice something. Does it make me a bad person if I say I'm not too torn up about sacrificing Hades? Unfortunately, it might mean I have to see her in the afterlife, which I'm not too excited about. However, at least her sacrifice made it so that we can send in Wartortle safely. Unfortunately for me, however, my my Wartortle is a raging heterosexual, thus falling for Delcaddy's charms. But I'm proud to say that he hit his water gun anyway. It wasn't quite enough to take out the Delcaddy, however, after she misses a sing and we somehow manage to break through love again, another water gun seals the deal, which means we got through all of Melly Melly with only one unfortunate loss. You wanna know what kind of item you should give your Pokemon to hold? What the fuck? Finally arriving on Akala Island, we have a slew of new encounters we can get, the first of which is on Route 4 where I find myself a Wimpod. And this thing is the opposite of Wimpy with the awesome download ability. I then head to Paniola Ranch where I pick myself up a Luxio, and honestly, I'd much rather have Intimidator Rivalry than Wonderskin. My luck on Route 5, however, is much better where I find myself a Ryolu. And while Gluttony isn't particularly cool, you don't get that much use out of Lucario's regular abilities anyway, so I see this as a win. And since the level cap is now at level 20, we can finally evolve Spiro into Firo. Before it's time to take on the second trial fight, which is normally versus Totem Wishy Washy, however, this time it's versus a Noivern. It also gets its attack boosted, which is terrible since at this level it knows Wing Attack, which could deal some massive damage. Fortunately for me, I regardlessly decided to lead with Choice Scarf Firo, allowing me to do pretty decent damage with a Stab Aerial Ace before it goes for agility, further boosting its speed. This means it'll outspeed Firo even with the Choice Scarf, and it ends up getting Ponyard as its ally Pokemon. The next turn, I almost end up taking half from a Wing Attack, after which I go for an Aerial Ace taking down Noivern into the red, after which a crit feint attack from Ponyard puts me in range to be taken out the next turn by a wing attack. There's really nothing I want to switch into a wing attack feint attack combination, but at least this gives me a safe switch into my Luxio, who after tanking a bite from Noivern can finally take it out with a spark. After that, all I need is a quick switch into Monferno and a quad effective mock punch to deal with a Ponyard. With another trial and another fallen comrade behind us, we definitely need a replacement. So I make sure to run around like a maniac until Riolu loves me enough to evolve into Lucario. I also go to Route 6, where I stumble upon a Geodude with Moxie, and Route 7, where I find a Gale Wings Rattata, which I immediately evolve into Raticate. I then head to Wella Volcano Park for the trial, and realize I can get another encounter, which happens to be an Auron. And while color change is really cool conceptually, it's actually a pretty bad ability to have. This is also a good point on the run to mention that the TMs aren't supposed to be randomized, and they weren't, but somehow they got scrambled. At this point, I'd also picked up a lot of Mega Stones from the random items in the game, but we're only going to be allowed to use them after we pass the level 30 mark. Before that, however, we have to face Kiawe's trial, and during his trial, you have to face two Pokemon before the Totem Pokemon without any healing in between. And these Pokemon could have been randomized into anything, but luckily and fittingly, they were randomized into Mag Cargo and Charmander. But by the time I had to face the Totem Pig Knight, Wartortle was pretty low on health since I had to swap it in for both of those fights. I also had the very unfortunate lead of Ivysaur, and even though Ivysaur or ended up getting a quick claw proc here, I wouldn't even have needed it to outspeed and poison this pig knight. I really want some residual damage on this thing just in case its ally Pokemon is something really difficult to deal with, and as my luck would have it, of course it's a Jirachi. This just made Ivysaur's matchup that much worse. So, obviously, in full panic mode, I swap out into Raticate, who gets hit hard by a Psychic. Then, after having my special defense drop, pig knight hits me with a flame charge, which not only takes me down into the red, but also boosts its speed, making it by far the fastest thing on the field, and Doremi unfortunately just goes down there on the spot. This at least gives me a safe switch into Luxio, who I'm pretty sure can't take a Psychic and Flame Charge combination, but Jirachi just goes for Helping Hand as the Pig Knight goes for a Defense Curl. This does somewhat lower the damage I do with Spark, which with Poison is at least a bit of damage. The next turn, the Pig Knight also graciously goes for Odor Sleuth, which means I don't get taken out by the incoming Psychic. This allows me to get off another Spark, but even that isn't enough to take it out with Poison, leaving Pig Knight at very low HP. Luxio's fate, however, is pretty much sealed at this point, being taken out by a Psychic the next turn, 
turn, but it's fine since at least we've taken out Pig Knight with the poison. While we don't exactly have any great matchups versus Jirachi, at least Lucario has Dark Pulse and can hit Jirachi down below half before we take a neutral Psychic below half ourselves. This activates the Orin Berry I gave Lucario before the fight, which would have allowed us to survive another Psychic if need be. However, the next Dark Pulse is enough to take Jirachi out. Oh, excuse me, I'm a scientist. You know what, Chorus? I've been told I look something like a scientist myself. You look like Willem Dafoe, but younger. Where's Spider-Man? Proceeding to Route 8, I've picked up a ton of fossils, so I decided to just restore the Claw Fossil, which normally turns into Anorith, but ironically, mine turns into a Tyrant. And with a plus attack nature and tough claws to boost all of its contact moves, I'm sold. The next trial is versus Totem Lorantis, which was very anticlimactically randomized into a Curlia. Its ally Pokemon was also a Mianchao, so easy trial. This means I need to set my sights on Kony Kony City for the grand trial, and on my way in the tunnel, I pick up a Slackoth with stake out. The fact that Olivia ended up being a total pushover was honestly kind of a nice break from all the chaos so far. Chaos is a ladder. A ladder that we're unfortunately gonna have to keep climbing. Reaching Ula Ula, I evolved Geodude into Graveler and Slackoth into Vigoroth. Seriously, I got a Mewtwo through Wonder Trade. So that's how you guys keep getting these legendaries. Before taking on the next trial, I made sure to see what encounters I could get, first off collecting a Volt Absorb Fampi, which is entirely redundant. I also have a Pokemon attack me out of a tree on Route 10, which which happens to be a Zangoose with Beast Boost. Now the first totem fight on Ula Ula was incredibly disappointing, but from this point onward, the level cap is above level 30, so things are about to get scary. The one good thing about the new level cap, however, is that we can finally evolve into Gardevoir. Moving on, I have the good fortune to pick up a Mawile, which does unfortunately have Damp as its ability, but it is one of the Pokemon I have the Mega Stone for. And then I said, excuse me, what? <laughs> and while passing through Tapu Village, I get to pick up a Pupitar, which is awesome, that has Cloud9, which is less awesome. I also finally get to evolve Ivasaur into Venusaur before it's time to take on the next trial. And of course it has to be versus Mega Venusaur. How is it that every time I use the Bulbasaur line, I get totally upstaged? Regardless, this is the part of the game where Sun and Moon get extremely serious, and all the totem Pokemon have plus one to every single stat. Since there's nothing great for me to switch to, though, I stay in, and Mega Venusaur graciously goes for a sweet scent, as I can get off a little bit of damage with Double Edge, but it almost does more to me. I heal most of that damage off with a Black Sludge, however, as Venusaur calls its ally Pokemon Ghastly. The next turn, I get hit by a plus one double edge, which does considerably more damage, leaving me at 36 HP, but granting me a Berserk boost. I also make sure to Sleep Powder the Ghastly, since that thing usually has some pretty annoying status moves. Expecting another double edge, I swap into Quasimodo here, and it doesn't really do any damage at all, but I don't really know where I thought I was going with this play, since the next turn, I'm obviously just gonna get taken out by a Razor Leaf. I prefer to not sacrifice my Moxie Graveler for nothing, so I go into Lucario as Ghastly misses a Sucker Punch, and I don't take too much from a Razor Leaf. And now that we're past level 30 and facing a Mega Evolution, I've decided that I'm gonna allow Mega Evolution for all the Pokemon where I found the Mega Stone. And Mega Lucario takes a double edge beautifully as Venusaur then takes some recoil damage, and I can take out the Ghastly with a Dark Pulse. In hindsight, this was pretty unwise, since Mega Venusaur could have called any Pokemon here, but I don't end up getting punished since it's a Mudkip. Even still, the last thing I want to do here is sacrifice my Mega Lucario, so I swap back into Graveler expecting a double edge, fully knowing that the next turn I'm probably gonna have to go down to a Razor Leaf. And I was gonna go into Monferno here, but I misclicked on War Turtle, which means it has to take the Razor Leaf, and it fortunately survives. That misclick kind of cost me a lot, and I decided just do the safest thing here, and unfortunately sack off my Graveler to the incoming Razor Leaf, just so that I can get a safe switch in. And I totally forgot about the Omni Boost here. Venusaur is definitely faster than Monferno, but luckily it just goes for Sweet Scent, meaning that I can take it out with a Flamethrower. After that, the Mudkip is easily handled with a U-turn into Gardevoir. A shame that we had to lose Graveler, but with the new level cap, we can at least evolve Monferno into Infernape, Wimpod into Galisopod, and Vigoroth into Slacking. With Nanu being another total pushover, we move on to the Aether Foundation, where we fight folks like Rich Girl employees and Schoolboy Faba. Excuse me, what? But they were really just the tip of the iceberg, since we now have to 
fight God Guzma. And his first Pokemon happens to be a Banette, which I would have easily one-shot with a sun-boosted flamethrower. However, he does end up hanging on with a Focus Sash and so graciously goes for a curse, taking himself out. This does mean we take 25% of our health at the end of the turn, and we're going to keep taking damage every turn, so as he sends in a Marshadow, I instantly swap out into Golisopod. And since its defense is lower than its special defense, I end up getting an attack boost, but Marshadow goes for roleplay, downloading our download ability, giving it a special attack boost. And I have no idea why it tries to go for roleplay again, but a Crit Shadow Claw doesn't quite take the Marshadow out, but since it insists on going for roleplay, we get the free KO. And I'm not complaining since I really don't want to deal with a souped up mythical anyway. Electros comes in and I try to do some damage with a Sucker Punch, but it really doesn't do that much and Discharge takes me way down into the red, so I definitely have to swap out. I go into Venusaur who resists the Discharge, but unfortunately the Electros gets the Paralysis. It then does a considerable amount of damage with Crush Claw as I get fully paralyzed, but at least get a bit of health back with Black Sludge. Another Crush Claw takes me deep into the red to just 12 HP, granting me the Berserk boost, but unfortunately I get fully paralyzed again, having to swap out Venusaur into Slacking. And since abilities are randomized, I expect Electros doesn't have Levitate, so I can go for a Bulldoze, lowering its speed and taking it deep into the red as it hits me with a Discharge, fortunately not getting the Paralysis, so I can take it out the next turn with another Bulldoze. His next Pokemon is Conkeldur, which is easy fodder for Gardevoir, who I learn now has Fairy Aura instead of Mummy. But as my luck would have it, of course I get hit by a Dynamic Punch on the Switch, confusing me. And it's this very unfortunate development that means I have to swap out into Golisopod, who at least dodges a Rock Slide. And while this does mean I get off a pitiful 25% damage, unfortunately the next turn I just fall to a Rock Slide, meaning that we lose one of my favorite Pokemon. From here, at least Gardevoir can come in safely and annihilate this construction clown with a Psychic. I then leave it to Mega Lucario to eviscerate his Ambipom with an Aura Sphere, which means we've beaten Guzma, but that doesn't mean I had a great time with Lusamine right afterwards. But since we lost our water type before taking her on, I make sure to grab Wartortle back on the team, evolving him into Blastoise. And look, Lusamine 1 really wasn't that bad a fight. I didn't face Pokemon that I couldn't handle. However, I fell to a stupid decision. And this is the perfect demonstration that you should never use something like Petal Dance or other moves that lock you in in a Nuzlocke, because inevitably, they'll send in something to punish you. Obviously, as soon as I clicked Petal Dance, Lusamine sent in her own Drought Infernape, and it proceeded to annihilate my Venusaur with a sun-boosted flame wheel, and all I could do was sit and watch. The rest of her team was super manageable, but what a dumb way to lose a great Pokemon. Leaving stupidity behind us, we make our way to Pony Island, where my first order of business is to evolve Tyrant into Tyrantrum. I then head on to the ancient pony path, where I pick myself up a Sawsbuck. What a perfect antlery boy. I give my thanks for your blessing. Oh. Well, I certainly don't give Hapu my thanks because the way this fight ended was not a great blessing. I end up leading with Gardevoir versus our Stoutland, which is an incredibly bad matchup since I don't think I can one-shot it and I'm incredibly frail on the physical side, so I go ahead and send in Tyrantrum. The next turn I get hit by a Crunch, which does a massive amount of damage as I go for a Dragon Claw, which does a bit less than half. Knowing another Crunch is incoming, I swap out into my Fighting type to resist it. The Stoutland then somehow outspeeds taking me down to 28 HP with Retaliate as I go for a close combat, at least being done with it for good. Hapu then decides to send in the starter I probably should have picked, Swampert. Not overly keen on the idea of being turned inside out by a water type move, I U-turn out into Blastoise. And because Blastoise both resists water and the sun is up, it does pretty much nothing. Then after a few turns of ice beaming this thing for damage, my team is not looking great. But since Blastoise can't handle too many more takedowns, I swap into Slacking, who actually handles it fairly well. I can then follow that up with a slash, but since Swampert is a bulky beast, it barely does half of what it has left, and I have to tank a Muddy Water, which does a lot of damage and gets a crit. Unfortunately, can't say the same for my next slash, which leaves the Swampert deep in the red and able to take out Slacking with a Muddy Water. In hindsight, Gardevoir has some great special defense, so I could have probably swapped her in versus a Muddy Water and then taken out the Swampert instead of using Slash and having my Slacking be taken out. I send in Blastoise who dodges a takedown, and amazingly after I go for a 
water pulse, I dodge another takedown. This allows me to hit the Swampert with an Ice Beam, bringing it into the red as a takedown takes me into the red and almost knocks out Swampert in the process. At least this allows me to take out Swampert with a water pulse as Hapu sends in a Dedenne. And I was foolishly not afraid of this Dedenne at all. I figured it'll go for a Steel or Electric type move as she charges up her Z move. And I've got some grave regrets about swapping in Lucario here, who gets undeniably one shot. Losing one of the best Megas of all time to a Dedenne is not something I'm proud of. Having this thing survive and take out my Infernape with a Thunder if it didn't miss would also be on that list. Fortunately though, I can just take it out with another Flamethrower and then handle the incoming Pangoro with a close combat. Her last Pokemon is then a Crobat, and almost out of health, I swap out into Tyrantrum, who's pretty low on health itself, as Crobat locks me in with Mean Look. A Leech Life then does about half the health I have left as I miss a Rock Slide. I can't switch out, so I just have to watch Tyrantrum go down, but it survives on 5 HP, and this time I do hit the Rock Slide, taking out her final Crobat. Ah, oh, what a disastrous fight. With two of our best Pokemon compromised, we need some replacements, so I evolve Fampy into Dunfen and Aron into Ag. Run. And thus it's time to take on the final trial versus Mega Aerodactyl. This thing's gonna be wildly dangerous, especially with every single one of its stats boosted. I end up pretty foolishly leading with Donphan, who gets hit by a takedown right away, which doesn't quite do half, as I of course miss a Stone Edge. Great. Aerodactyl then calls its ally Pokemon, which ends up being a Raichu. The Raichu then hits me the quick attack, which just barely edges me over half, as a takedown takes me deep into the red to just 12 HP, and I decided to just go for an Earthquake, taking out the Raichu. Honestly, I should have probably tried for Stone Edge again to deal some damage to Aerodactyl, but now of course I have to swap out, so I go into my newly acquired Aggron. Quick Claw does allow me to move first, and I can use a Stab Iron Head to take Aerodactyl below half, and unfortunately it doesn't flinch, using Crunch to change my type to a Dark type. Unfortunately, bringing Aerodactyl below half means it calls its second ally Pokemon a Charizard. For this reason, I decide to swap out into Blastoise, who immediately dodges a takedown, and can a flame burst incredibly well. The next turn, Aerodactyl does connect with the takedown, but after the damage it does to itself and the damage that I do with Water Pulse, it almost gets taken out, but I manage to land the confusion. And it ends up working out beautifully since Aerodactyl takes itself out in confusion the next turn. One Water Pulse later, and that's the Charizard dealt with as well, meaning we've gotten our way through every single trial in the game. But that's really no reason to celebrate since right afterwards, we have to take on possibly the hardest boss fight in all of Pokemon, Jellyfish Lusamine. Leading off with Braviary, yet another flying type versus my Dunfan. Poor girl can't get a break or hit a stone edge for the life of her. The next turn, Braviary goes for a tailwind to boost the speed of Lusamine's team as I finally hit the first stone edge with Dunfan. It unfortunately does a lot less than expected and she heals up a lot of health with an Enigma Berry. And would you believe that the turn right after that, she misses another stone edge? Thanks for that, Dunfan. Being at such low health, I decide to swap out into Agron as she switches it up and goes for a Crush Claw, which changes my type into normal. This makes the next Crush Claw do a lot of damage with that plus one attack boost as a Stone Edge leaves the Braviary in the red, despite being a critical hit. Unable to take another attack, I decide to swap in Tyrantrum as she just resets her Tailwind. The resisted Air Slash doesn't do too much damage and I can take it out with a Crunch right afterwards. But of course, Lusamine's next Pokemon would be a Snorlax with a boost in special defense. And knowing that this thing has Heavy Slam, I send in a Fighting type to be able to resist it and Infernape takes it very well. The Snorlax must have Prankster or something since it gets to go first with Belly Drum having its HP, which honestly just makes it easier for me to take it out with close combat. Normally, the defense drops from close combat would be a terrible thing, but since her Mighty Enna has Imposter, it actually copies your boosts as well. Even still, I really don't want to risk a speed tie and get taken out because of my defense drop, so I go ahead and swap in Blastoise who gets hit by a Flamethrower. And even though it's not very effective, it does about 40%, so I decide to Mega Evolve just to get a little bit more bulk. However, I guess seeing that I have a water move in my move set, it decides to go for U-turn, sending in Roserade instead. This is pretty unfortunate since it's a terrible target for Focus Blast to hit the one time it does. Really expecting a grass type move here, I swap in my own Infernape, but it just goes for a Poison Sting. It's also incredibly poor timing that the sunlight fades just before I use this flamethrower that doesn't quite take out the Roserade, but since it just uses a not very effective Mega Drain, and I take it out the next turn with a flamethrower anyway, 
anyway, it doesn't really matter. Next up is Bee Barrel, and I'm once again incredibly surprised to be outsped by this thing, but at least it misses its takedown so that I can use U-turn and freely swap in Blastoise. This time around, it does hit takedown, taking me down to 20 HP, and amazingly, I connect again with a Focus Blast, destroying the Bee Barrel. Up next is a Drudagon with Psychic Surge, and as bad luck would have it, this thing also has an attack boost. Knowing I'll get taken out if I stay in, I swap out into Donphan, which is sort of a sacrifice, but since Donphan is so bulky, it actually ends up surviving the Night Slash. This at least allows me to use one Earthquake, taking the Drudagon just below half HP before it unfortunately destroys Donphan with a Rock Climb. And with lowered health, at least the Drudagon is simple to knock out with a Draining Kiss. This only leaves Lusamine with one last Pokemon, and I should have been way smarter about this since I knew it was Mightyena with Imposter, which is now going to transform into my own Gardevoir. What I also should have done instead of just blindly attacking is start setting up Calm Minds. Instead, I don't want to get taken out by a Shadow Ball here, so I decide to swap out into Agron, who just gets destroyed by the Shadow Ball instead. Next, I send in Infernape, who I know is faster since I'm facing my own Gardevoir, and I can go for some decent damage using U-Turn, swapping back into Gardevoir. And I was really hoping for Lusamine to go for Psychic, but a Shadow Ball takes me down to just 4 HP. Not wanting Gardevoir to go down, I swap in Tyrantrum, which ends up being a disastrous choice since she goes for Draining Kiss, which heals her back up all the way to full, and I lose Tyrantrum. At this point, I've already realized that I'm going to lose most of my team, so I decide to go for a Flamethrower for as much damage as possible, which is when Gardevoir goes for a Calm Mind. This means another Flamethrower is most likely not going to take her out, so I go for a U-Turn, swapping out into my own Gardevoir, knowing that this is her final turn. My Gardevoir was truly her own worst enemy. The only consolation in that I've lost four members of my team is that I can finally outspeed with Infernape, taking out the remainder of Gardevoir's health, which at least wins me the fight. Ladies and gentlemen, our team's in a bad spot, but luckily, there are still a few locations we have yet to visit, the first of which being 10 Carat Hill, where I find a Shroomish. And having the Corrosion ability on this thing might actually come in handy. I name it the Mad Hatter and immediately evolve it into Breloom. Then after picking up the best Pokemon that my box has to offer, my Mount Lanakila encounter ends up being a Dratini. Then all I had to do was evolve Pupitar into Tyranitar and Dratini into Dragonite. I also have a random ability capsule from my travels, which allows me to change Dragonite's ability to Regenerator. And with that, I'd assembled my Pokemon League team. Firstly, my starter Drought Infernape with Flamethrower, Close Combat, U-Turn, and Mach Punch. Secondly, Mega Blastoise with Water Pulse, Dark Pulse, Ice Beam, and Focus Blast. Mega Evolving it somehow changed its normal ability to its Mega Ability, which I guess I'll take. Damp Mega Mawile with Sword Stance, Play Rough, Sucker Punch, and Iron Head. Not having huge power is Mega Unfortunate, but what are you gonna do? Erosion Breloom with Seed Bomb, Mach Punch, Leech Seed, and of course Poison Powder to poison those Steel types. Regenerator Dragonite with Dragon Dance, Fire Punch, Thunder Punch, and Outrage. And finally, Sand Force Assault Vest Tyranitar with Crunch, Earthquake, Fire Fang, and Stone Edge. The time has finally come to take on the best trainers in the Alola region, starting out with Kahili, who leads off with Magmortar. Immediately, this means that leading out with Infernape is a terrible idea since setting up the sun not only powers up its fire type moves, but it must have Chlorophyll to be able to outspeed me, and it almost does half of my health before I can U-turn out into Tyranitar. That at least means Tyranitar doesn't have to take a flamethrower on the switch, but the next turn, it doesn't really matter since with Assault Vest, it doesn't do too much damage and a Stone Edge is enough to take out Magmortar. Next up is Victory Bell, and since it only has grass attacking moves, I'm free to swap in Dragonite, who resists it four times. This means that Victory Bell is the perfect subject for me to just set up a bunch of Dragon Dances against. Now, I may have gotten a bit carried away, setting myself up all the way to plus six, but I don't think I got myself into Aftermath range, so I'm not taking any risks as I take out both the Victory Bell and Weezing with Fire Punches. Unfortunately, a plus six Fire Punch isn't enough to take out Crocodile, so I do the unthinkable and lock myself into Outrage, taking both it and Cricketune down. I then get confused after two turns, which would have been very fortunate if this were a fairy type, but since I would have just taken out Slacking, it's kind of unfortunate. Expecting a punishment here, I can freely swap in Breloom and go for a Leech Seed as Slacking goes for Counter. I then miss a Poison Powder, which at least gives me one extra turn of Leech Seed damage before swapping in Infernape as the Slacking just goes for a Counter again, and it hilariously has Solar Power as its ability, draining even more of its health at the end of the turn. I opt for Flamethrower instead of Close Combat, since if Flamethrower doesn't take it out, at least I don't get countered. Versus Acerola, 
I don't lead with Infernape to not get punished by Drought again, but since her lead is Lorantis, I guess I kinda got punished anyway. Especially since I decide to lead with Berloom, and because Lorantis is a grass type, I can't use either Leech Seed or Poison Powder. I guess figuring she can't really do anything to Berloom, she swaps out into Musharna as I go for another Mach Punch, doing basically no damage at all, and then swapping out into Tyranitar. I guess Acerola's AI is just in a really swappy mood, since she swaps out Musharna for Shiny Keldeo as I go for Crunch, doing pretty pitiful damage. Not wanting to get destroyed by a Sacred Sword, I swap out into Dragonite as she sets up with a Sword Stance, which is really scary. To not let her get any more boost, I go for a Thunder Punch immediately, which actually just ends up KOing. Next up is Steelix, which hilariously has Grassy Surge as its ability. Not wanting to get Stone Edged into Oblivion here, I swap out into my Tyranitar as she very graciously sets up a Sandstorm. And what happens next is possibly one of the most beautiful moments in any of my Nuzlocks, where Acerola goes for a dig, setting me up for extra damage with Earthquake on top of the extra damage from Sand Force that she set up for me. Unsurprisingly, she then sends back in her Lorantis, which charges up a Solar Blade, not doing any damage to me this turn, as I go for a Fire Fang, which doesn't quite take it out, but leaves it with a burn. And it's pretty annoying that she gets healed by the grassy terrain here, since Burn and Sandstorm might have taken her out otherwise. But now that I know that the Solar Blade is incoming, I can easily just swap into Dragonite who quad resists it, and barely take any damage at all. It's also pretty obvious that Acerola is going to go for a full restore here to heal up Lorantis, so I can easily just take the turn to set up a Dragon Dance to get to plus one attack and plus one speed. Since Lorantis, like Victory Bell, only has grass moves to attack me with, I can just go for Dragon Dances until I'm at plus six again. From there, it's a free KO against her Lorantis and Beedrill, but her Musharna manages to survive in the red and put me to sleep with Hypnosis. Because of this, I obviously can't stay in swapping out for Tyranitar, who with another few crunches after Acerola goes for a full restore can claim the win. Third of the Elite Four is my favorite, of course, Olivia. Starting out the fight with Grumpig, I felt pretty bad about my choice to lead with Berloom. Obviously expecting a Psychic type move here, I decide to swap out into Tyranitar, and what I didn't expect is for Psychic to actually hit me. Uh, the only plausible explanation I can come up with here is that Grumpig's ability got randomized into Normalize, which would also explain why it's not very effective against my Rock type. Now you might think that Olivia having a Deoxys versus my Tyranitar is not a big deal. However, its attack form does get superpower, so I immediately swap out into Dragonite to tank it. And the only good thing about this scenario is that it's definitely going to go for one of its three other psychic type moves now, so I can just swap in Tyranitar, who's immune, and then repeat swapping in Dragonite, who's now fully healed because of Regenerator. Fortunately, superpower also only has five PP, and after it's used up all its PP, she immediately swaps out into Victory Bell, which sets up the grass surge. It of course then gets hit by the crunch on the switch, taking it down into the red. I know from the previous victory bell that we faced that this thing only has grass moves, so I decide to send in Infernape, but the grassy terrain actually makes this leaf storm do incredible damage. And so, with the power vested in me through the ability of drought, I totally destroy victory bell and her next Shenotic. Predictably, she then sends in her psychic powerhouse Deoxys, but since I now know that it doesn't have any superpower PP left and only has psychic moves, I can easily send in Tyranitar and take it out with a crunch. With that crisis averted, her next Pokemon is a Lucario, which certainly is not great for Tyranitar being quad weak to fighting, so I immediately swap out into Dragonite, getting hit by close combat on the switch. And close combat lowering Lucario's defense is perfect since that means I can one-shot it with a fire punch. Her final Pokemon is then an Electric Surge Lipard that gets one-shot by an Outrage. And beating Olivia means there's only one more Leap Four member to beat before it's champion time, and that's Fisher Hala. Sending in Vicavolt first, I once again have a terrible matchup versus his lead with Tyranitar, so I immediately swap out into Infernape as he goes for a Bug Buzz. Being resisted, it barely does any damage at all, and the next turn I outspeed and take out the Vicavolt with a super effective Stab Sun Boosted Flamethrower. Chimeco is next, and not wanting to get hit by its Psychic type moves, I decide to go for the super effective U-turn, which does do more than half, before I swap out into my Dark type Tyranitar. However, it ends up just going for Safeguard on the Switch, and the only move it can use to attack me with is a not very effective double edge, so I can just easily take it out with a crunch afterwards. The real problem is his next Pokemon Tyrantrum, and I don't want to get hit by this thing's Earthquake, so I immediately swap out into Dragonite. This immediately raises the threat of Dragon Claw, so I send in my Fairy-type Mawile. And as I was doing this, it occurred to me that I could just switch back and forth until Tyrantrum was completely out of Earthquake, so I could safely take it out with Mawile. And so, once I'd swapped back and forth 20 times to deplete Tyrantrum of its 10 Earthquake PP, I Mega Evolve Mawile 
as the Tyrantrum interestingly goes for Breakneck Blitz using Thrash as its base, which actually does a fair amount of damage as I set up a sword stance. A Thrash then takes me down to 41 HP as I go for a play rough, hoping to take it out, but the Tyrantrum is left on what must be 1 HP. I then should have seriously gone for Sucker Punch, but I kind of half expected Hala to go for a full restore, so at least I get to take it out with a play rough. Being at 4 HP, I really can't stay in against this Empoleon, so I swap in Dragonite who gets hit by a Brine, which barely does any damage at all, as Moody raises Empoleon's special defense and lowers its evasiveness. I really don't want to deal with Moody, so I start attacking, and I end up getting a critical hit Thunder Punch, which probably mattered. I then continue my Thunder Punchage versus Mandibuzz, which does a little bit less than half as it sets up a Tailwind. Embargo then really isn't a big deal, since I'm not allowed to use items anyway due to the hardcore Nuzlocke rules, as I just set up a Dragon Dance. Because of Tailwind, Dark Pulse goes first, but it fortunately does not flinch me, so I can get off a second Dragon Dance before taking out the Mandibuzz with a Thunder Punch the next turn. Ola's final Pokemon is then Drapion, but it's got no chance against a plus two Dragonite using Stab Outrage, meaning that we only have one opponent left. And our final opponent is the feared schoolgirl Kukui, who naturally leads the fight with my greatest weakness, Rayquaza, but not just that, a Mega Rayquaza. I should consider myself very lucky that I at least got the lead right this time, because a Dragon Pulse doesn't do too much to assault us Tyranitar, and a Stone Edge leaves Rayquaza in the red. He then swaps Rayquaza out and sends in his Conkeldur as I go for another Stone Edge, which doesn't do too much damage. To handle the obvious fighting type move here, I send in Dragonite as he goes for Hammer Arm, which at least lowers his speed. The reason I swap back into Tyranitar here is to get all of my health back on Dragonite, and I was expecting the Stone Edge, but he just goes for a scary face. My reasoning to swap in Mawile here was I thought I could handle a fighting type move way better than this, but it did a lot of damage. Regardless, because of Conkeldur's speed drops from Hammer Arm, I decide to Mega Evolve and try my luck with Play Rough to see if I can take it out, but because I don't have huge power, I don't, but luckily it just goes for Scary Face. Since I'm unsure whether or not I outspeed anymore, I send in Dragonite, but considering it goes for Scary Face again, I think I probably did. A Fire Punch then frustratingly leaves Conkeldur at like 1 HP as it Scary Faces me again. Now incredibly slow, I send in Tyranitar as this clown continues to try and reenact the movie It. Then, incredibly sick of Pennywise, the construction working clown, I decide to just click Earthquake and take it out. Kukui then has the perfect counter to me in Amoongus, so I immediately swap out into Infernape. And it's honestly pretty hilarious that I set up the sun here with Drought right as the Amoongus clicks Solar Beam, which means it can use the move right away instead of having to wait a turn. I'm honestly kind of impressed that it did about 40%, but of course a flamethrower in the sun is going to take out the Amoongus in one shot. Kukui, of course, has his own starter Swampert. Knowing that I'll outspeed, I go for a U-turn, which allows me to swap out into Breloom. Swampert then tries to go for Endeavor, but since it has more HP than me, it doesn't do anything, and I can follow it up with a Seed Bomb the next turn, taking it out since it's quad effective. He then, of course, sends back in his Rayquaza. And since this thing has a quad effective move in Air Slash, I definitely have to swap out, sending in my Tyranitar as Kukui goes for a full restore. A Dragon Pulse takes me down to where it's very questionable whether or not I can take another one, and Stone Edge once again brings Rayquaza down into the red. Expecting Rayquaza to go for Dragon Pulse again, I send in a Fairy type, but it heals itself all the way back up to full with rest. The one saving grace here is that at least I know it's going to stay asleep for two turns, so I use the first one to set up a Swords Dance. The second turn that Rayquaza is guaranteed to sleep, I go for a play up, hoping it's enough to take it out, and it does. Kukui then sends in his second to last Pokemon, Stoutland. I try to go for a Sucker Punch to get some damage here, but the Stoutland just roars me out, sending in Dragonite. I'm kind of thinking he might go for Roar again, so I decide to get as much damage as possible with Outrage, as he indeed goes for Roar, sending in my Blastoise. He probably went for Roar again, as Blastoise keeps its perfect Focus Blast record, taking out the Stoutland. This leaves Kukui with his final Pokemon, Mega Slowbro. Because my Dark Aura is up, I decide to go for Dark Pulse, which is going to be a three-hit KO, as it sets up the Rain Dance, and another Dark Pulse gets it into a range where one more will take it out, as it hits me with a Psychic. Unfortunately, Kukui, of course, has another Full Restore, and the next time I manage to get the Slowbro down into the red, it starts to use Slack Off. Unfortunately, this started a cycle of Kukui holding on to Dear Life with Slack Off, after Full Restore, after Slack Off, until I decided to look up Slowbro's moveset, which is when I realized that I was being an absolute idiot, since its only attacking move was Psychic, meaning that I could freely just swap in Tyranitar and take care of it with a couple of crunches. And that's how I beat a Pokemon Moon Randomizer 
hardcore Nuzlocke. In fact, I didn't even lose a single team member during the Elite Four or Champion, which is a rare thing to get to celebrate the Hall of Fame with your entire team. And listen up, dear viewer, if you're this far into an Antler Boy video and you're not subscribed, what are you doing? Go ahead and hit the like and the bell and whatever else I'm supposed to say as the YouTube guy. And I suggest you leave me a comment about what you think about randomizers or what other Pokemon challenge I should take on next. Personally, I've been thinking of Wonderlock. I think that could be fun. But remember, until we see each other next time, where's Spider-Man?